This is chapter two of the Small Town Guide to Self-Reinvention, written and read by Christopher J. Jones. The next day, Tuesday, Jenna May met her daughter Carol for lunch at Classic on Noble. Classic was a nice restaurant with white tablecloths and fine china. Jenna May enjoyed the food there, but she blanched at the prices. Lunch cost a little bit less than dinner, though, and besides, Carol was paying today. When it was Jenna May's turn to pay, she preferred the buffets at M&J Home Cooking and Western Sizzlin', both down in Oxford, where you could gorge till your stomach hurt without emptying your wallet. Even if you didn't want to gorge, at those buffets you could put a combination of institutional quality spaghetti, fried chicken, and Salisbury steak on your plate without sending any award-winning chefs running for their smelling salts. But Carol was some kind of bigwig with the Calhoun County Chamber of Commerce, and she liked to be seen patronizing more upscale places. Seen by the right people, that is. Many, many people would see her at either of the buffets, but a large number of them would be transients just driving through on I-20, or the busloads who stormed the sizzlin at H hour of D-Day for the Tuesday senior discount. She would technically be seen, but she would not be recognized as a chamber bigwig out on the town by those people. Carol so liked being seen at Classic that she always reserved the round table right up front by the big picture window. She claimed to prefer that table because it had the comfiest chairs, but Jenna May's favorite table, a less conspicuous little square one by a smaller window in the very back dining room, had the same kind of chairs. No, for Carol, it was about being seen, paying high dollar for a fancy salad and famous shrimp and grits in a fine restaurant that had managed to thrive in a decidedly downscale small town. Highway hordes and nursing homes would keep the cash register ringing at the cheap buffets, but finer places needed a push, and Carol from the chamber was all about pushing. The front table was also within full view and easy hailing distance of the entrance and the hostess station, so Carol could see and converse with whoever was seeing her as other patrons arrived and departed. Jenna May was used to Carol's ingrained need to work the room when they ate at the restaurant of her choice, and she did not consider it a character flaw. She knew that Carol was no more rude to her own mother than she would have been to any other dining companion. Her daughter was gregarious both by nature and by profession, and Jenna May was proud of her ability to raise the energy level of whatever room she was in. Commerce of some kind would go on with or without such ardent promotion, but Carol was a woman on a mission to drag this county, caught in Atlanta's shadow at sunrise, and in Birmingham's at sundown, into relevance. That mission continued right on into the lunch hour. Jenna May knew that for Carol, paying classic on noble prices while sitting unseen at a back table and murmuring only to her mother would have been an unthinkable waste of an opportunity. Jenna May was, therefore, surprised on this Tuesday when after only a few minutes of being seen and seeing and greeting and farewelling, just minutes after their salads arrived, Carol suddenly committed two unnatural acts. She dropped her silenced phone into her purse, then slid her chair around so that her back was to the dining room, shutting out her public, and she was right there, leaning close to Jenna May. Jenna May, who had been communing with her wedge salad while Carol engaged with passers-by and her phone, looked up from her plate and into Carol's face, now just a foot away. Going from supernumerary to main character so abruptly and finding herself the focus of Carol's gaze was a shock. She said, well, hello, Carol. Fancy meeting you here. Carol said, ha ha, mom, I get it. But look, no phone. I'm all yours now. Jenna wasn't sure that this was a good thing, 
but she gave Carol the benefit of the doubt and simply said, well, goody, how's your salad? She knew that Carol had not taken a bite yet, as she had been raised to not talk with her mouth full, and she had, until this interlude, been talking nonstop. Carol said, oh, let me try it. She had the noble salad, which was something of a production with three kinds of fruit and nuts, plus cheese and dressing. Mmm, good, it's fine. Jenna May said, this wedge thing is good too. I sometimes think of making one at home, but I always tear my lettuce up and wash it and spin it, especially since all the E. coli scares. So I never really have a big dense head to carve out a big hunk like this. Do you suppose they wash it here? Even these wedges? Oh, they must. Otherwise, I would be crunching on grit. It probably wouldn't seem so special at home. If I did make my own, you know, I would just love to pick up that big honking wedge in my hand and dip it in dressing and chomp on it directly instead of, instead of having to cut off little bites of it like this. Do you ever want to do that? Carol said, sure, Mom, I dream of it often. But listen, the salads are great and all, but let's talk about something else. Jenna May thought about tormenting Carol further and had a mad urge to pick up her remaining fraction of salad wedge in her hand and take a half moon shaped bite out of it. But she relented and said, okay, dear, what's on your mind? Carol took a deep breath, blew it out and said, mom, like I've told you before, I hate to see you sitting alone in that big old house. Jenna May said, this again? I should have known it was something super important to you when you turned your phone off. Carol was not, could not be offended any more than a battering ram would be harmed by splinters obtained while crashing through a door. Oh, hush, this is important to both of us and I really want you to know I'm concerned about you. Jenna May said, I know you are, but there's nothing to worry about. I like our old house and our old neighborhood. You liked it well enough grow too, growing up. We had good times there, and it's not all that big. Carol said, see there, you still say our house and think of it as a family home. I left home 20 years ago, and it has been just you there for five years now. Jenna May said, well, it's not exactly a huge place, even for one person. We did spread out a bit after you grew up and left, you know. Made your room into an office. Elbow room, cried Daniel Boone. She wagged her elbows, chicken dance style, to demonstrate. Carol said, please stop that. It's too much house for one person. Jenna May protested. What with the office, now I only have the one guest bedroom and nothing else extra. How is that house too big for me? Carol who in her profession was more attuned to absolutes, such as square footage, than to what someone might consider homey and comforting, repeated, it's just way too big for one person. Anyone can see that. You are surrounded by whole families living in that size house, or smaller. But that's not the only thing. I don't like you having to go up and down those porch steps and basement steps. It's not safe for a woman your I mean, of a certain age. That did it. Jenna May pushed her last bit of wedge salad away and leveled a finger at Carol's face, which gesture she realized came off as very aggressive from this close up, but she went with it for now. You listen here, young lady. I still run four mornings a week, three or four miles at a time. I stretch and lift weights in my unsafe basement after going down my unsafe steps, and when I'm through, I somehow manage to crawl back up those unsafe steps. I run in 5K races, and I would have a pile of first place trophies if Alberta Lieb didn't beat me by 10 feet in every race. Alberta Lieb, who lived in nearby Chakalako, was Jenna May's personal athletic nemesis, a woman who had been beating her by mere steps in races for nearly 20 years ever since they first met up in the 40 to 44 age group. Alberta Lieb was so fast that she could safely let her opponents draw within a few feet of her and even pass her in the last tenth of a mile, 
but she had an unbelievable finishing kick and would contrive to give Jenna Mae false hope only to snatch it away at the finish. The sadistic bitch. Jenna Mae's goal of someday beating Alberta Lieb was what kept her from ever skipping a planned run or workout. Oh, to cross a finish line without the sight of Alberta Lieb's flouncy ponytail taunting her. Alberta Lee may have been blessed with the fast-twitch leg muscles of a teenager, but Jenna May had staying power and would never give up, even if it meant training and competing until they reached the unlimited age group, 90 and older. Spectators would think they were adorable, these two dusty old skeletal forms, <laughs> one with the grizzled remnants of a ponytail, out there toddling around the course, people never realizing the intensity of the lust for victory still, <coughs> still coursing through those ancient brains. Carol said, I know you're in great shape now, Mom, but I'm just thinking ahead. Jenna May, still fuming, said, And what's this about me being a woman of a certain age? You do know that's a grievous insult, don't you? Carol said, No, it isn't. It just means somewhere between middle age and old. So see, I'm saying you're not old, really. It's a compliment when you think of it that way. Jenna May said, oh no, where I come from, it means an old spinster or a used up person who serves no function or something cutesy or gross. It's never used to describe powerful, successful women, no matter how old they are. Did they call Margaret Thatcher or Golda Meir women of a certain age? Heck no. I've heard that label used on everyone from 40-year-old man chasers in hot pants to the little white-haired ladies who sit alone in the back pews at church. Don't lump me in with any of them. I am not some certain age group. I'm exactly 63, and I can whip your butt in a race up and down my stairs for as many times as you like. Alberta Lieb would not be invited to participate in this private event. Advantage, Jenna May. We'll see who needs to call medical alert first. Jenna May was venturing into choppy waters, for Carol had begged her mother to subscribe to medical alert and wear one of those call for help buttons around her neck at home in case she fell ill or down the stairs. Jenna May had steadfastly refused to do that on the grounds that such products were for old biddies, something she was working hard not to become. The stairs challenge also carried other subtextual freight because Carol was substantially overweight and a race on the stairs really would put her in medical jeopardy. Carol leaned back and raised her hands in surrender. Okay, mom, I'm sorry. Can you lower your voice? She folded her arms on the table and leaned toward Jenna May and said earnestly, listen, it was just an expression I didn't mean to insult you any more than you meant to call me a fatty. I never did. Well, saying you would run me into the ground on the steps and I would need to call medical alert, that's about as subtle as woman of a certain age if we're going to be looking for insults. Carol had not risen to chamber bigwig by not being able to dodge torpedoes while returning fire in rough seas. Still stinging from the perceived insult about her age, but chastened by her own ugly words, Jenna May said, I'm sorry too, dear, and you are not a fatty. You're beautiful. Hey, you could jog with me some mornings if you wanted to. Mom, or walk. Yes, at first, just walk, one or two. Mom, we're getting way off topic, and I've got a meeting in an hour. Will you just hear me out? Well, I'm sorry. I didn't know we had an agenda. I thought we were just having lunch. As if summoned by a royal clap of hands, at that moment, Carol's famous shrimp and grits and Jenna May's less renowned but still very good turkey club sandwich arrived. So the women stopped talking un until their plates were situated and the waiter refilled their iced tea glasses and left them to their meal. Jenna May hefted half of her club sandwich and said, when mother packed my lunch, it was one, I repeat, one slice of bologna between two slices of Wonder Bread. That's why I always let you buy the school lunch and gave you money for extra if you wanted, you know. Just look at this stack of meat. Carol said, 
you do know that's deli sliced smoked turkey and not bologna, don't you, Mom? Yes, please. This last was directed at another server who was wandering the dining room and raining freshly grated Parmesan cheese onto dishes on demand. Jenna May watched the server crank the handle on his grater and reflected that his cheese dispensing function was performed at the buffets with no panache, but at considerably less expense by stainless steel bins in the salad bar. Jenna May said, of course I know that. I ordered it, didn't I? But I'm just saying I would have killed for a sandwich like this when I was little. That pack of bologna that mother bought would last a week, and that's with three kids eating off of it. One slice per kid per day. Did you ever get the urge to pick up a whole pack of bologna and just take a big old bite out of it? They sell these things I call bologna bombs at Christian Corner Meats. 80 ounces. That's five pounds. It's shaped like the Hindenburg, only rounded on the ends and in a bright red wrapper. I could get one of those just one time. Carol said, it's bologna, Mom, not bologna. And what is it with you and taking big bites out of things? <laughs> First with the lettuce wedge, and now, what's so funny? Jenna May said, I was just teasing, trying to see how long you would let me go on. Actually, she had come dangerously close to revealing her secret self-reinvention project to Carol, which would have spoiled the fun. Earlier, when Carol was doing her usual slapping of backs and pumping of paws from her side of the table, Jenna May had fallen into a reverie thinking about the part of her program that involved taking a bigger bite out of life. She knew that in the expensive self-help programs, this phrase was meant conceptually and you had to buy books and seminars for them to tell you what it really meant. But her lettuce wedge had inspired her to think about the phrase more literally. Why not take actual bigger bites out of actual things? <laughs> who declares what size bites we should take and who elected them to that position? This led her to picture herself as the queen of big bites with teeth appropriate to the task. She still had all of her own teeth thank God in Colgate and Aniston Dental Group, but for her big bite campaign, she would need those ceramic implants she was always seeing advertised in the newspaper. A size or two too large for her mouth would deliver maximum biting efficacy, as well as visibly marking her as a taker of big bites. And so, surprised as she had been by the sudden unaccustomed attention from Carol, she had started from her chomping vision and had blurted out what she was thinking about the wedge of lettuce. And now here she went again, this time babbling about b biting bologna. She had to be more careful. She covered her tracks, but also satisfied her literal urge by taking an enormous bite of her sandwich, burying her mouth in it such that the corners of the triangular construct were touching either side of her face. She smiled a loopy smile at her daughter as she chewed the resulting cheek-popping mouthful. It was so good that way. Who knew you could taste with every part of your inner mouth? Not small bite takers, that's for sure. Watching her, Carol muttered, God bless America, <laughs> which was her go-to substitute for profanity in public. But at least she was smiling. The conversa conversation paused again as both women dug into their food. 